Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of Revit Pure Live. I am your host Nicolas Catelier. I'm an architect and BIM specialist. I'm live here in snowy Quebec City, snowy and cold. Uh, so first thing, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, a lot of people live today. So far 154 viewers. The chat is already pretty active. Uh, so just glancing quickly, people from Brazil, uh, for Frankfurt, India, Austin, Texas, um, uh, Michigan, Colorado, Tennessee, Israel, Salt Lake City, Switzerland, so all around the world. Uh, as usual, thanks for uh, being here. Somebody says there's bad e echo. I hope that there's uh, no sound issue here. Uh, before moving on with the guests, I will announce the next episode with Melissa Thiessens from Team Parallax. She's going to be on next week at 3 p.m. And the title of her session is Lessons from Becoming Consultant. Melissa used to uh, work as a BIM manager for a firm and she's recently made a switch to being a consultant. So pretty excited about this episode. Um, before we get going with guests, uh, a small thing, Revit Pure pamphlets. The pamphlets are PDF guides that you can download for free at revitpure.com slash pamphlets. Uh, you can see all the topics we've uh, explored so far. These are free PDFs of about 20, 30 pages, sometimes more, depending on the topic. You can download the entire collection for free here by giving a name and address. And tomorrow we're releasing a brand new pamphlet about door schedules. So if you register, you'll get uh, the pamphlet in advance. All right, pretty active chat. All right, so our guest today is Bill Carney. Bill works as a design technology specialist at DLR Group based in Minnesota. Let me bring him in. Hi, Bill. How are you going? Good. Yourself? Pretty good as well. So thanks for accepting the invitation uh, for Revit Pure Live. The first question I like to ask my guests is, how did you get interested in BIM? <laughs> um, <laughs> Long well, story. Thanks for having me. Yeah. That, <laughs> uh, actually, no, I, I do have a canned story for that. Mm -hmm. um, coming up, like I started using Revit in, in 2004. And it was before a lot of the BIM standards were as big and robust as they are today. And for me, it was literally just, I hated coordinating like elevation detail callouts and sheet numbers and level names. And I just wanted to do my job faster. Mm -hmm. um, and then everybody started coming out with all the standards and complicating it. So for me, it was just, I didn't want to coordinate things that seemed uh, low value to me. Yeah. You didn't want to spend time on the, the boring stuff. Mm-hmm. And so today's presentation, we're going to talk about interior design. How did you get interested in that? How do you start developing these workflows? <laughs> um, I mean, it's basically the same thing. Interior design is full of a lot of boring stuff mm -hmm. um, for people that really like to design. Um, but for myself, you know, I, I worked in architecture doing designing for about 10 years before transitioning into a technology leadership role. Um, and so like I, I've worked as an interior designer on projects i've done furniture packages and signage packages and just from a odd career of working on like every project type i've got a really well-rounded background in like how people have to do their jobs um so for this it's it's interesting it was actually kind of painful for me du dusting all this off because it was during like the most busy hardest time of my life where i had a kid i was remodeling mm -hmm. my kitchen um, and as the BIM director at BSA Life Structures and working with our interiors group, we like mapped out a whole workflow. Um, and it really all started with uh, this problem of the accent wall line. So they'd show a, a line on their plans of where they wanted a, an accent paint to mm -hmm. go and they'd tag it. Yeah, yeah. And getting the corners to go like it, it shouldn't be that hard to like make a corner that cleans up and it just wasn't. And so we had kind of that aha moment of like, Hey, what if we took the room boundaries and offset them in drew a line on it and just checked the left or right arrow and that put the arrow on it. And so because of that, it was like, 
yeah, we could do that. And we, we explored it. We explored the other stuff and we just saw Dynamo as like this way over the hurdles of what Revit should do, but couldn't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me, we're not, I'm not sharing your screen right now. So let me switch to that so people can no. see as well. So, sorry if you've yeah. been sharing, I've been glancing at your face. So let, let's go back. We can now see, uh, see your screen. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, uh, the accent wall symbol I was talking uh -huh. about. Yeah. 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 It, you know, they would draw from here to here and then they'd have, um, these weird overlaps and they really want it to just go along and then show a line at the end. So like trying to program a Revit family to actually clean up on the outside and inside of curves was just this massive pain. And so what we figured out is like, we could take the outside boundary of a room and offset it in, and then just check a box to show either left or right angle at the end. And that's all we needed. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, yeah, it was just kind of an aha moment that pushed us into Dynamo. And then we mapped the whole workflow of how start to finish with interiors, we would do it. Um, and then next thing I know, I've, I'm doing a LinkedIn learning course on it and presenting it at AU and built and yeah, it was a whole bunch of stuff. So I think, so to put people in context, I first got into your stuff about interior design by going through a LinkedIn learning mm -hmm. and the course is uh, interior design in Revit with dynamos or something like that. So I didn't mm -hmm. get that that far with uh, the, uh, this detailed component for accents wall. So can you t tell us the gist of it? Is that with, so this is a detailed component, but there's also a workflow that involves uh, Dynamo? Yeah. Um, so really like the whole thing was um, started out with our interior design group. They would do like schematic design drawings and they'd use color fill schedules early on in the project. They would like put these thick lines where they wanted accent paints. They had this uh, wall legend. And then when they got the construction documents, it changed. But then in between, they do, you know, renderings, presentation, floor plans. And it was like, how do we do this better without all of this redundant, tedious transferring of information? Um, and it was literally trying to figure out how we can make a family that can do this is mm -hmm. how we ended up on Dynamo. Um, and I at, at the time, I would present often at conferences and I'd, I'd have a lot of the stuff the conference was far enough off, I'd know how to do it. And I'd try to let that be the, like the thing that pushes me to finish everything. And so this was one I presented at Autodesk University in 2016 or 17. Um, and so I, I did that and we went through, um, yeah, we did the walls here and how to make materials, how to place materials, um, how to deal with inside and outside room wall boundaries and the problems that are in there um it was a whole bunch of stuff and then i ended with this of how to like place some wall protection on a wall and that kind of as i developed it further and got a lot better at it it was like how do we avoid um you know, like this wall to make sure that this extends underneath and that's what a lot of the things that happen in the other linkedin learning course that i did um, so I did this presentation and then did the LinkedIn learning course uh, shortly after it. And then I presented that at built that next summer. And then I did the advanced course after that. And so it was like this long, like two year period of just doing interior and dynamo stuff. And um, mm -hmm. while dynamo kept updating. So like it, the whole thing would change, all the nodes would break. They'd always do it right before the presentation. So I was just <laughs> like constantly working till 3 a.m. trying to fix stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, it seems to me that you got into an uh, uh, interior design dynamo rabbit hole and that you explored it uh, to the max. Yeah, <laughs> so took it as far as I could. Yeah, and it, it seems a lot of your the stuff is based on room information. Is that right? It is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of like if I had to put a thing of like my whole career. Mm -hmm. um, my first presentation at a conference was uh, at the BIM workshops in Omaha, and it was called Database to Design. And it was all about collecting information in Microsoft Access and pushing that into rooms and how far you can take it. And you know, like the LinkedIn learning course on Dynamo, yeah, it's for interior design. But if you break it down to like placing families that are line based or point based and then or that happen around a room or that happen on planes. Um, it's really more about collect information inside of a room and how much you can place from it. And it's why there's a product out there called uh, Topologic that I usually keep a really close eye on because 
their whole concept is a cell which is a room and mm -hmm. all of the rules apply around it and i really think that that's where we can go with the industry with this stuff to really speed things up mm -hmm. yes yeah, so something i've noticed in uh some of your script which we're going to to get into i guess is that uh, you're well so far i haven't completed course but you're, you're trying to seem to stick with uh, mostly with out of the box nodes yeah that's a linkedin thing um mm -hmm. and so that's oh, okay. kind of why i wanted to point this out it's like um my ideal workflow is like interior designer either has information outside of revit it's associated with a parameter in a room um and all you have to do is push a button and if the floor finish says carpet one it'll make the material it'll make the floor type and then place it but a lot of that stuff comes from custom nodes um, so none of that's in the LinkedIn learning course, but it is in the Autodesk University and, and it's also in the built write up if you can find that anywhere. And you can also find me on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll send you whatever you ask for. It sounds good. So if we come back to that little paint, uh, accent wall drawing, can you show us an example? So what, what happens if you use a dynamo with it? Um, <laughs> I don't have one that will work right now okay. um, because yeah. of the versions keep uh, updating. Well, that's the one be and really like since I've since BSA Life Structures, I've gone to DLR group um, as the design technology leader and we aren't really doing this. So I haven't bothered mm -hmm. to update it and then, like there's no uh, need for it, but it's it's this is where that was at when I was working on it and the the advanced LinkedIn learning course talks about this problem right here. You can see the line stops and it really focuses on how Revit reads these room boundaries. And when a wall comes into it, it sees this as two separate lines. So even though there's a paint line that goes across here, it was only drawing to this and having problems with that. So the, um, a lot of the chapter one of that course actually shows how to fix that issue. Yes, yeah, sure. And, um... All right, so trying to see if there's anyone in the chat, if there's something about the interior design that, that you want to ask about, uh, feel free to do so. So what do you think is a, is a good point to start? Do you have kind of a favorite part of interior design that you could show an example, either in, in, um, in Revit? Honestly, I was going to show a little bit of like the point of each of these chapters, because they're all set up, um, like chapter one, it's all basics, but if you were to, to go into this and wanted to actually do something with it. Mm -hmm. The last video of each chapter really like compiles all of these things. Like these are all steps to learn how to do this one last thing. Um, so I was just going to walk through these four um, and then the, the conclusion on this course, cause it's all of the stuff put together. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, the, the chapter one of this one, it's very basic. It's, you know, how do you select a room? and place families along a line. So it's like, you know, read the room boundary, break it up into points. So if I say I want shelving around this room at 12 feet on center, you know, how do you find the wall, divide it by 12 feet? How do you place the family and make sure it rotates around? And then we also did, um, I've, I've got a passion of facility, BIM for FM, so facilities management. Um, and a common thing with that is like, they want unique names on the things that they're maintaining. So yeah, we're placing shelves, but pretend they're doors or mechanical units. Um, so I put into this, like you can concatenate together different pieces of information to make unique numbers just by pushing a button. So what you do, and it's, it's never fun showing Dynamo on one screen. I'll say that. Um, but yeah, so this is the script that you walk through, um, you know, Pick the family, find the level, read information. So if the level's got a number or a name to it, um, combine all that information together and then set the mark value on the families. And it goes through and it places all of these. You know, this one, it's on the first floor. So we had an 01, the walls northwest. I just put in some marks in there, but then it numerically creates a new thing from the level, the wall that it's on, the room that it's in. And so you've got 01, NW, 010, because that's the 10th one. This one's 09. Um, so it just walks through showing how to do that. And to me, it's, it, those are really basic things, but I, I personally have always liked this course because it walks through each of those steps and you can apply that to so many different things. 
Yeah, that's what one of the first thing I saw, and that might seem obvious, but I think most people are not using this kind of script for it, uh, this kind of work. Uh, and uh, your script, this version, in addition to placing the families, so in this case was like bookshelves, it mm -hmm. also uh, automatically placed a mark that is related to uh, the mark of the wall as well. Exactly. And it, um, I don't know, like, if you think of electrical outlets, if, you know, those are rule based. So I just said shelves at 12 feet, but really there's mm -hmm. so many things that are linear around the perimeter of a room that happen at a set frequency. And so you just place whatever family type it is. And so I, I really tried to, with the course, like, you know, place a point ba based family, place a line based family, place a systems family and join it to the wall next to it. Like do things so that you have the tools to do whatever you need to and just change the terminology based on the task you're trying to do. So in the case of the, the script you've just shown, it was based on, on the room as well, right? It, it Correct. The, the boundaries of the room. So it was not the wall. You don't need to select the wall. You need to select the room. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'll reopen it real quick. Let's see. Give it a second. Um, and a lot of those, it's more of like you get into look at your whole floor plan, select all the rooms, read all the parameters and do the thing. So it starts out with a single room, but by the end, it's always select all the rooms. Um, and then the the advanced cores, it's select the corridor and read all through the doors that are touching the corridor because you do like in the corridor, that's where you place your signage. But on the rooms themselves, it's always the opposite of the corridor. Um, so you can do a whole bunch of stuff because of that. So, so this, like is, this. this is the Dynamo script and the, the, the select model elements we can see here. In this case, this, uh, you selected a room. So Correct. does that mean that you could uh, draw a room using a room separation lines and uh, use the same script? Yep. Hmm. Yeah, and hit and miss on that. Because um, sometimes, you know, if, if I want shelves and this is a room separation line, if I don't handle that here, it's going to put lot all the shelves along that line. So you have to do a lot of stuff of like what hits into what. And so these, it actually takes the line and I find, um, let's see right here. There's let's see. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Um, so here, what it does is it takes the lines around the room and it puts a point in the center of the, of the line. So on each wall of it, it clashes the wall with the boundary line of the room. And I do the center of it because if I do the start point or the end point, I hit the adjacent walls usually. So by doing the center of the line, I can find the individual wall that that edge is hitting. And then I can go and place all the families of the shelves along that line. Yeah, we have a, a question from uh, ScoreDX here that asks, uh, if you have a wall opening, will the script recognize it? So um, I, I guess not because it's part of the of the room, right? Correct. Um, this one does, and it, you know, it's, this is the basic section. Actually, it's this one here. But what this one does is um, this section here, chapter two in the advanced one, it will take the geometry of the wall and basically does the, uh, it clashes the, the line of the room boundary against the wall. And what you get is the inverse. So wherever it hits a wall, you can see the line for that, and it's a line-based segment. I've actually got a decent, um, a decent diagram for that. So what what it does is you offset the boundary up to where you're going to have the wall protection, and if you do the um, geometry does intersect. I think. Let me just open that one. Are there more questions on this before I open another file? Uh, I don't think so. Somebody asked if uh, this tool works when the architecture model is linked. Um, none of these are set up for it. And you can either reach through to the linked model and select the room, or you use a room syncing tool, or you build a script to synchronize the rooms. Um, and there are some things in here that you would be able to build that from, um, it's really in the, the synchronization section. Um, I do talk about how you look at the rooms and how you basically compare 
the information that's in there because at a point you have modeled information and this talks a lot about how you synchronize that with a finished schedule or a tag and there it stores it in a parameter in a room so you're always comparing and it's never in sync because Revit's rooms don't read live the floor that's inside of it or the wall that's inside of it. Um, so you're using Dynamo to basically clash all the finished stuff inside of a room and then write to specific parameters. Um, so someone asked uh, about the script. Let's say for people that don't have access to uh, LinkedIn Learning, are there some of the scripts uh, we could share on, on the post later on? Yeah. Um, honestly, I can put the... Do you want me to put them in now or just after? Uh, after after the session, I'll add a link. So if you come back to the uh, this video, I'll add a, a link so you can download download all the scripts. Well, yeah, all the scripts that you're uh, willing to share. Um, I freely share most of what I, like everything you learn from somebody. So it's mm -hmm. I don't even know where my my information starts and stops. Um, but really, the Autodesk University and the built one, I share. Um, the whole robust scripts that walk through doing all of this stuff. Um, there's more custom nodes in those, and I haven't touched them since I gave that presentation. So they will break. Um, if you have troubles and questions, you can ask. The LinkedIn Learning course, um, you know, it's LinkedIn Learning. You can sign up for a 30-day trial. It's also lynda.com. And what I have found is a lot of people get, um, like, they'll go to the library and they can actually get a subscription to lynda.com. So there are ways of getting this for free. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So we, we saw a script that uh, allowed you to automate the placement of bookshelves and, and the perimeter of the room. And also to automate the process of creating mark that is related to the, to the wall. So is there something else that you, you wanted to show? Or I think one that could be interesting is creating the finishes based on, on the room information in the schedule. Yes. Do you think, could you show that? We, we certainly can. Um, I will skip a section. Let's see. Yeah, check to make sure I open the right file on this. Um, Yeah, so this one, it's, and if you're looking at the top, chapter two, video five, um, this one, it draws a floor finish. So we do wall finishes, uh, floor finishes, um, wall protection. If I updated this today, I would add in ceilings because now that's part of the Revit API and it wasn't at the time of doing these. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, but it's, you know, read the parameter information. So this one, it's mm -hmm. going to look at floor finish. And this is called CT1. Um, and this is a, another challenge with it being linked in and using the out of the box nodes as much as possible. I didn't have like duplicate type, but if you go to the Autodesk University stuff, I read this parameter and check and see if there's a floor type called finished floor CT1. And if there isn't, it'll duplicate a floor and then make that name it the type and then it'll duplicate the material and add it to it and name that CT1. And I just use like neon green so you can spot like, hey, I've got a new material and I haven't assigned a, a you know, visibility setting to it. Um, but it, it does work. And then there's also in the, I, I definitely talk about it in AU and this is another one that it's not, um, it's not an out of the box node, but eventually like interiors, they'll draw different finishes inside of the room. And so what this did at the time is you'd select all the rooms. It would basically take the volume of it, find all of the different finish types, map parameters, but then you know, extend the room up to the ceiling and fix that. Cause usually it wasn't there. And then also join the, the floor finishes inside of this room's floor finish so that they cut out of each other for renderings. Because what we always had is like interiors, they would just overlap and then you'd get an Enscape and they'd, it'd be the flashing materials. Um, so that's part of it. And I do touch on that in the course. Um, let me get this open and stop talking for a second. Yeah, and that's a little bit here. It actually even offsets the floor finish by the thickness of the floor that it makes. Um, but this one, if you did the course, the, I opened the one at the end state. And so I, 
you know, I go through where you can manually select the individual rooms or here I selected all the rooms in the model and filtered for rooms called toilet. And it was just for example's sake. Um, but these ones called toilet, they have a finish in there. And when I hit run, hopefully it works. You know, it, it finds the rooms, it goes through finds you know, there's the floor type by name so it finds all the rooms with ct1 in it and then it um you know finds the level that the rooms are on so that you can do floor by outline type and level and so it's reading information from selecting the rooms it sees what room or view you're in um sets the floor type to it with the boundary and then offsets the floor and sets it to not be room bounding um, and so now you can come in here and select the floor and there's CT1. And so it goes through and draws them, and you can see it's, um, it's oh, it didn't set that, of course, uh, but it's offset by a quarter inch. And usually you can just pick, you know, room bounding, no. And so you can go and do that, and you can select all the rooms. And so that's where, you know, we were talking about the database design. If I'm doing a room data sheet workflow, I just fill out information by room type, and then I push a couple buttons, and I have all my finishes drawn. And then I'm, as a designer, focusing on like, hey, I want curves outside of this wall, or I want a cool pattern down this hallway. Like, let the boundary manage most of the information. Mm -hmm. And then you design a little bit and then use a synchronized button to make sure that the, you know, the room schedule or tag, whatever you're using, shows the correct info. Yeah, that's great. So, okay, so it create that works for simple rooms. If you want something more fancy that is not necessarily bounded by the room, well, then you will you will manually edit it. And mm -hmm. so what about walls? Is there a way to uh, create walls from schedule? And what happens uh, with openings like doors, for example? So with the walls, I draw a thin wall. And I'll actually just manually do it. Um, let's see. So with these, we drew a thin wall and I'm going to go to thin line so you can see. So you can see it's sitting off this. Mm -hmm. And then in Dynamo, you know, it just like the shelf uh, script, it knows what wall this is sitting on. So then it's just use the join command to join your new wall with the adjacent wall. And so the modify tab, um, it's just using. Why am I not spotting this? I, oh, that, wow, that's on me. Um, but then click this wall and that wall, and it actually trims it out. Um, yeah, by so using then, the join tool. Yep, works perfectly. Now, I did have the lacing wrong when I first did that, and it was set to join this wall to every wall inside of the entire file. Mm -hmm. And um, I had like 10 million errors <laughs> from that. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, be careful when you're doing that, because that it can programmatically make a warning in your file and then everything is cripplingly slow. So, okay. So in that, in that case, so you just created it manually, but are you saying that the, typically you would do it using Dynamo and then you just need to uh, join or the, is the join also made in Dynamo? Uh, the join was made in Dynamo. Okay, so what we, okay. and what I talk about in the AU presentation, I don't even have the, I won't open the file cause I know it won't work. Um, but yeah, the... because of the like for some if for some people are not uh, familiar with Dynamo, it's with each new version of Revit and each new version of Dynamo, some of the nodes uh, get expired or they're slightly modified. Uh, so for old scripts might have issues, you might ha need to fix a couple of nodes. Let's just try it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, let's see. Yeah, I guess because uh, this that, that was made with uh, 2018. So I guess you don't yeah. have that anymore, right? Nope. Uh, let's see. Okay, floors, wall finishes. I'll see if I can spot what would break. I know the categories. And again, a lot of this was really early. So I've actually learned a lot of like how you troubleshoot and avoid scripts from crashing from version to version so a lot of them were using like the drop down for category um yeah like that well it definitely won't work um mm -hmm. i won't buy, i'll just describe it we basically selected the room and so it took the boundary of the room 
and it drew giant pink detail lines around the room and it allowed mm -hmm. the user to select which one of these lines it wanted to have a finish on it and it would read the the parameter for accent wall or uh, wall finish and so it would read that if there wasn't one we had another menu that popped up and said hey you want to put an accent wall on this what finish do you want they'd type it in it would make this thin wall type and material type and then let them pick the lines that they want to and place it and then join the adjacent walls. And then um, I'll show the I'll show the legend stuff because that's also why that happened. So I had showed um, this graphic here of they would take the walls and they had very thick lines that they would want to show the material. And sometimes early on, they wouldn't know what like the material color was. So I had uh, two different legend creators one would make this legend and then create the view filters and override all these walls with a view filter uh, based on an Excel list of colors. And then the other one would read the material color and make the walls based on that. So as they progress with the project, they could just push the button and this legend would be created. And you know, if you've used legends in Revit, they kind of suck in that um, you know, like I can't tag this wall and I can't even apply the same view filter as this. So I had to actually use the Dynamo script to copy all of the things down in this view and then use text to label from parameters and then override these with the same color to match the settings of this filter. Um, it was a real weird workflow, but I can show it. So that's in chapter three. Um, and this one, yeah. Almost there. See, I'm going to think this one works. Yeah, so this is the script. It selects all the wall types in the project. Um, and this one, I believe, is reading the material. But those thin walls, we put an assembly code on it for an interior's finished wall. And so we selected all the walls in the project, filtered out for the walls that had this finish uh, assembly code on it. We found the material color, and then we set the overrides based on the material color. Um, so this script goes through, and you select inside of a legend. That you know, if you think of it with Revit, the legend doesn't have three D coordinates, so I like can't say place family as instance at a point, but I can copy by a vector. Um, let's see what it does. Yeah, and you can see that it makes this line down here and it copies evenly spaced based on a point. Um, and then it went through and it overrode each one of these legend components and then copied the text box down and set the text to match the parameter information of this because we can't just tag the walls inside of a legend, which I don't love the workflow, but it does work. And so if I add a new material in here, I just have to run that button and it makes my legend and then the other thing that we did with these scripts is, you know, here, some of these materials are placed. So there's PT1, um, the other script, and let's open it. And you can see there's some changes in here. Like it's, it's all progression and learning in LinkedIn of like, each little video will teach you something else. So this one, it, it gets to a point where we apply this to a view template. So you can do it to one view and have it consistent across all. Um, but again, you know, nothing colorized. I hit run. Cool, nothing aired out. Um, it went through and it created view filters based on the walls. 
Um, so if I go to the filters here, it made a new filter and set the color to it and gave it a thick line um, with that color matching. So it overrides the lines to look exactly like they look inside of that legend. And so I can make a sheet I have no idea how this is coming through graphically because that looks pretty light to me. Um, but I can have a wall legend on this sheet that's in sync with the exact same colors of this being PT1 with the same colors that. And you can't do that otherwise. Um, so there's a lot of stuff like this that we just figured out because of Dynamo and it was a ton of fun. So, so uh, to recap, in, in that case, uh, the room override, was it created from, from the room information and then applied as an override to the walls? Um, this was done, um, we actually modeled well, are, are these the, the little finish wall that you mentioned earlier? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So these are, the, you have the main walls and then you have the, the thin finish wall Yeah. that is uh, very thin only for the finish. And then by using the room information, you, you've pushed it and you've created a legend. Correct. Well, that's pretty great. And it, it seems to be working with the most recent version as well. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I was opening them up and running them, and I was shocked that it actually ran better. So the kudos to the oh, Dynamo cool. team. It uh -huh. it's ran better than it did when I was doing these. Uh -huh. um, so th that's a you know it's a measure <laughs> of success. But you can see here's the isometric. Um, that's mm -hmm. one of those thin walls. They're you know an eighth inch thick. They're set to not room bounding, so they don't mess with your square footage. They're joined to the adjacent wall, so that the um, you know, the door opening stay in, in sync and you can jump into Enscape and take a look at it. Hmm, that that's really cool. So and this one also uh um removed the openings. Mm hmm Automatically that was the dynamo script as well that did that, right? Yeah, and you know there are all the scripts in LinkedIn are like small pieces just for that individual vid video. But uh -huh. the last one always has everything combined. Uh -huh. um, and then if you go to the either the built conference, I posted a share link of those uh, or the Autodesk University, those scripts are like the big workflow that we would actually use of like, hey, we're going to select all the rooms in this floor and read all the parameters and place all the floor finishes. And then the next one would go through and let you pick where you wanted different finishes around the, the room. Um, and then the last chapter in this, um, it it goes through the synchronizing um, and I'll show something to kind of explain that. Let's see. Where are you? Oh, here. So at BSA Life Structures, we had this finished block legend. And DLR Group has similar, um, where you've got a, an annotation, and it'll say the floor finish, and then they would have, like, a note over here of if there was, you know, C plan or multiple finishes or things like that. So the LinkedIn learning course, uh, I went through like every way that I've done finish schedules because I know somebody's somebody else isn't going to do it this way. Somebody's going to have a schedule where they're going to have a comma. So it does walk you through like, how do you read a room, read all the materials inside of that room, find the larger area material, which is, you know, like the field floor or the field paint. Um, and put that in and then put a note to see plan or concatenate them together or put in a comment that says per plan or per, you know, C, uh, C drawings or whatever you want to do. Um, so it's really just you got to work with your team. And then the synchronizing, um, I talk about this in LinkedIn Learning, but it's hard where you can just run it. You, you can't just overwrite everything. The designers will not trust it. You'll mess something up. You'll miss something. So we had to have like rules. So here we put in a column for wall finish and then wall finish review where it would highlight that these don't match um and you could check box this to drive that and so basically you know check the the current schedule of what's inside of the room finish parameter have them check it and change the ones that don't match or it gives them that little bit of control um because you are synchronizing information that somebody has drawn and that is also in a parameter and they they aren't in sync 
Yeah, I see. Interesting. So I think we should answer a few questions. Mohammed asks, uh, your advice to start learning Dynamo? Take my course. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have a basic Dynamo course as well? or? Um, I, the true advice for me is like, find a task. Uh, yeah. I'm a blog person. Like, Find a blog post on something you're interested in. Do that step by step. And then try to do change what it's doing for something else. And then that's probably going to be the thing that drives you. And then get on, if you're that type of learner, get on forums and search for the next thing that you want to do. But start with something that is step-by-step -step that tells you how to do it and then stretch it into something you think it can do. And then before jumping in, just saying, hey, Dynamo should be able to do this. I want it to do that. Like you're not going to get anywhere with it and you're probably going to really kind of miss miss the mark or get frustrated like i've heard too many people say like oh i open it it's hard i can't use it and it's like well step by step follow something that does work and then change it and that that's usually the best way i can learn things yeah i would say i've just released on, on the, the rivet pure channel uh, a dynamo beginner uh, crash course uh, about 20 minutes video and on my latest managed course i talk quite a while about dynamo as well but i agree with you like that's the way i've learned it it's to actually have a problem when you have mm -hmm. a real problem that's you, you get the most riled up and you actually finish the job else mm -hmm. because you might watch a couple of videos for a while and then you kind of forget about it but if you have a deadline and a real task that's when you you learn for real and if you're doing that and you have a deadline make sure you have that like safety net person that can yeah. help you <laughs> Um, and the one thing about Dynamo, Grasshopper, uh, any of the like grassroots programming type of things that are out there, the people on the forum are really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a bunch of people that like to learn and like to share what they've learned. And if you put yourself out there and help people and ask questions, you're going to get answers and people will help you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Dynamo forums are great for that uh, amazing community. And I'm actually uh, having in two weeks uh, John Pearson. Um, oh, nice! From uh, Parallax, the creator of the Rhythm Nodes and Monocall mm -hmm. as well. So it should be interesting. Uh, a few other questions. Scar DX asks, uh, "Have you used parts? I find that works well with the wall material." And he, we... can, he says you can schedule and use filter. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, we explored it and. For anybody that doesn't know parts, um, you can select a wall or you can select through a linked model um, or inside of your current model. I don't know why I can't select anything here. That's weird. Let's go here. There we go. Um, you can select the wall and then on the modify tab over here, normally you can create parts. Um, I'm not sure why that one doesn't want to do it. There. So you can hit create parts and what it does is splits a wall into its layers and then you can say, you know, divide them up and split them. The challenge with that is like the steps to do it when the, the design changes, you have to click on this, edit it, edit the boundary and go around. So we, we evaluated it. I think it's good. I would not knock anybody that's using it. This is what we as a team settled on was these thin walls because it was you know, most natural of I can just draw a line back and forth and join it next to it. And I'm not trimming out the part anywhere or um, maintaining a boundary when this wall actually spans all these rooms. Because for me to do it, I would have to split each one of those parts at each room to create a different finish on it. Yeah, I agree. I've played with parts and it, I found that it kind of uh, messes up the wall. <laughs> I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't like it. I also recommend the, the thin walls. And if the, with the good use of your filters, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, uh, it's a great, uh, workflow. Um, other questions, uh, what do you think about the use of keynotes for interior design notes? I, I have been a keynote user since my first use of Revit. So I'm a big advocate of keynotes. I'm a big advocate of revolution designs, keynote manager. Um, to me, the more connected the information is the better. Um, there are weird little hiccups that happen with keynotes, um, but for interiors, I think it's really fantastic because you have the user keynote, the element keynote, and the material keynote. So you can apply three pieces of information to that same object 
and you're not just making it dumb you can actually put it there and it's associated with that thing and to me if we want to get to bim as a deliverable or do anything bigger and, and even like you know bim for fm the more information that's associated with it the better off you can be yeah i agree keynotes are great um Cat Daddy uh, says, I'm afraid to commit to Dynamo's and into your firm, we must use whatever Revit version the architect uh, use. Compound that with maintaining Dynamo version seems like building on quicksand. It can be a yeah. challenge, right? To maintain all the, all these scripts. Yeah, if you're not if you're not good at it you, too. You, you, need, you need a team to, uh, to help you with yeah. that. You need somebody that's confident and good at it that will get you through it. Um, But I'll show an example because, you know, yes, it's quicksand, but you know what else is quicksand? A moving design, and I have to put corner guards on all of the corners and all the other things. And so this is that other course. Um, so it may be a strategy of, like, pick the one task that is really time-sucking and tedious because um, this is, like, to me, my personal favorite one. Um, and I actually show this in the conclusion video, but, you know, my whole thing is if you store information with rooms – you can start to work from the room to drive information. So I can pick this corridor and I can read all of the to room and from room information from the doors. And even when it's like flipped or mirrored and not making sense, I read both and know that it's the opposite of the corridor. And I know exactly where to place all of the signs and wall protection around the, the room. Um, so the advanced course talks about point based families and line based families, and then a signage, door that you place on the doors and it flips left or right based on the doors flip um and it, it's it's one i'm proud of i'll put it that way so chapter five there's a script in there that just says combined final and i combined all of them it's set up to run with one wall um or one room and so it's meant to select the corridor but you can do all the rooms at once i have done that um But it's here you select your room it's big and it, i basically copied the steps of all of the other videos into it um, but when you hit run it will read all of the lines on the inside and outside boundaries of that corridor and identify all the outside corners and place a corner guard and then in a minute or so it's going to pop up with your signs and the room name on it and all the other things that you'd need for wall protection i hope it runs hmm. interesting yeah i hope to to see that It seems like a pretty big script. So you, it's, you say it incorporates information from uh, your prior scripts. Yeah, each like it, it could definitely be pared down. But you can see right there, it went and placed all of those things around. Um, and I'll show it in 3D. But yeah, like I, I just pasted each section into this as the conclusion to say, hey, combine them all. This is what you could do. Um, but when you do it, it, it goes and places all of the wall protection it hits all the outside corners uh of you know the areas and it ignores the inside corner so if i select there there's not a corner guard but if i select here there is um and it goes through and it places the sign um, so there's a door signage on the correct side of the door and the correct side of the corridor for every single door around the room which when i talk to interior designers like this is one of those things like all of this is rule based of you know a door sign goes in a certain place based on this door and you have to show it for some reason you can't just put a general note on it in certain building types many types you can just say put corner guard at all outside corners um but if you like for me i started out with a lot of healthcare, and we actually had to model and elevate every single wall Um, I started in California with Oshpod and it was every single room, every wall had to be elevated, meaning I drew a little line for wall base as a drawing. And like, it was really painful. And so to me, like this task to be able to place all of that stuff is totally worth maintaining Dynamo. Yeah. And, and we can see the little, uh, the door sign, uh, uh, as you mentioned. Yeah. And it's reading the room name and, and number. Uh, and, and... Wait, wait, it automatically creates the, the name of the room. Yeah, oh, I went amazing. a little overboard. <laughs> um, so yeah, like it, it to me, and again, all of this stuff working together of making like presentation graphics, your documents, your deliverables. Um, I can jump in an Enscape more frequently and review, which promotes mm -hmm. better design. Um, it all works together, and it's from collect information about a room 
understand how to master the room boundaries and the geometry types, and you can do anything. All right, that's uh, a pretty cool script. So is that from your advanced course? Is that, uh, yeah. uh, uh, can people get their end on, on this script? Yeah, so, and yeah, that's one I, I do share. Um, but yeah, the advanced course, it talks about dealing with, you know, inside and outside boundaries and openings within the room because these make different loops where mm -hmm. a wall intersects, you know, this is going to be two wall lines versus just what is actually one. Um, it talks about the family that is made. So I made a line based wall protection, uh, point blade paste point based door signage, um, and then a corner guard family. And it talks about how to place each one of those individually. And then this last script shows putting them all together. Make sure that's muted. Yeah. It's you've just seen it, but yeah, it's, it's this. Yeah, that, that's cool. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, if I have your permission, I think I'll create, so for people watching, I'll create a, a blog post with kind of uh, describing e each, uh, some of the scripts, those who are willing to share, I'll explain with a mm -hmm. screenshot. So check out the description and within a couple of days of this live session, I'll add something so we can download it and know what the script does. Awesome. So uh, yeah, thanks. To, so that, that was amazing. There's a, a few more questions I think are worth uh, thinking. Um, uh, Mark asks if you can put these scripts in the Dynamo player. Uh, they were all intended for it. Um, that was the whole reason of doing it. And great. And how did the interior designers react? Did they love it? Did they were they enthusiastic about it, or were they reluctant? Very reluctant. Mm -hmm. um, there's one person, Jessica McBride, that really took to it and uses it. Um, pretty powerfully um and also used Enscape a lot so they benefited from it where the rest of the group was isolated from that person so that it didn't take as well um it's always been my intent of like build out the workflow in dynamo and then when you've got it figured out then program it into a stable revit add-in because it mm -hmm. it will be faster it will be more stable uh but with a lot of the stuff you have to kind of iron out the details because it's a big collect information. What's the parameter name? What's the family type that you're going to do it? How do you check? Is this a point based or a line base? And it, it's a lot of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so this allowed us to think through it and you could like on the fly show something different, like, Hey, we can put a comma between all these finishes and put it in your finish schedule. Or do you want it to just say per plan? Here's how. And then once you know that, then go and program it. Yeah. And, uh, Ellie asked, would Dynamo for interiors be overkill for small projects such as a thousand square feet addition? So what basically about the scale of the project in that case that was an hospital, is that the kind of workflows you've used on smaller projects as well? Yeah, I mean, the the sample file that I was presenting on was just a clinic. I mean, and it, it's beneficial for this alone because we would have to show a color fill plan for the floor plans. And then we had to show a rendering floor plan. And so like they would go into Photoshop at the time and Photoshop a picture of the floor. So like that step alone between those two things of, well, now I'm just gonna make the floor with the material on it. I'm really managing a couple things and I actually do benefit. Yeah, yeah, you, you get, if if people understand the scripts, it's as mm -hmm. v viable for the small or big projects. Uh, Patrick asks if you can change the design and rerun the script. If, does it automatically remove already placed object? So in the place of the signage, for example, let's say you want to update them, how would you proceed? Um, there's nothing built intended for that in these, but mm -hmm. um, what we've been doing, it, like at that point to me, I would be getting it programmed. Mm -hmm. um, and with Revit, there's a thing called extensible storage, um, and you can actually store information behind or inside of your Revit file. Um, so we do have some custom tools that we've been working on with that where, you know, it's going to adjust based on like, you know, I did an array of furniture inside of a room. You can work on that and actually store those relations and then update it. All right. Yeah. It almost sounds like we need uh, uh, a Revit plugin for interior. I don't know if there's I, one already, but uh, based on all these workflows, wouldn't it be amazing? I totally agree. Yeah, and I'd be happy to partner with anybody looking to do something. Yeah, that would be great. Great business idea, actually. 
<laughs> All right, so we're getting <laughs> close to, to the hour. Is there uh, anything else you wanted to show? Any? Uh... I had one. Um, okay, let's go for the last one. Yeah, so we've been working with Imagine It building out this space programming tool. Um, and so it collects all the room information, does your room data sheets. Um, and this is my pitch of, hey, if anybody else is doing this and wants to share, um, we're trying to work in the machine learning and do a lot of research. And so this is Dan McKenzie. He is our um, data scientist. And he's been looking at all of the data across our projects. And I know this is really hard to read. Um, oh, of course, bad job. Um, it'll get back there in a second. But basically, it's reading that room and predicting the type of furniture that should be inside of that room. And so here it's saying that this is a justice and civic project. This is the room type. And then um, we're creating more like room kits of furniture layouts. Um, so they're starting to push in the layouts into rooms. Um, and it, to me, there's a lot to be said here, but I, I need more data to make it even better. But like this was our proof of concept of, you know, each one of these is called dining. Uh, this one's called food. So it spotted that those are similar words and it laid out, but it's also looking at where the door is, the center of the room, making sure things don't fall inside of these spaces. So adjusting to the nuances of a design. Um, so I, I think there is a ton to be had in this idea that a room can store a ton of information. Um, and then we're also, this is smart copy where like push all the stuff to the room, let the designer lay it out and then go and copy this to all the similar room types. So all of these are rotated and it looks at the door, the center of the room and things like windows and walls, but it'll go and lay out all the furniture around the space. So these, I'm just looking for active collaborators and people that want to share data to try to get a little bit better at this stuff. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, so yeah, it, you can see there it went, did all the stuff. And this is Matt Conway, our computational design leader. Um, he does things I can't do. And like, it, it's just fantastic having talent like this around you. Um, and it, yeah, it, it's just a fun times ahead, I think. Yeah, for sure. Automation is, is growing bigger and bigger, uh, which is great. And you seem to be doing a lot with rooms. That's what I, I get from the sessions, the, the power of rooms to create elements. It is my model. obsession. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it, like all the disciplines, there is something room based, um, right down to calculating out what loads are required. So it, to me, it's all about the rooms. Uh, Laura asks what that was called. Uh, this is just our custom DLR group add-in that we're, we're building internally. Okay, um, it's internal, it, yeah. This was my shameless plug of, hey, if you use Clarity and you have a lot of rooms and want to export some data, I would love to talk to you and look at how we can share machine learning models because we're, we're getting down to our building types and the, the common rooms because we're ignoring uh, the difference. Like if it's you know lab one, lab two, lab three, we'll drop off the numbers and assume that they're all lab. And then we can look at all of our projects and guess the types of things that should go inside of those spaces. Uh, so you've talked about rooms and Patrick asks uh, a great question about MEP. Have you been working with spaces at all? Yeah. Um, and, and the big spot that we're working with spaces right now is to export to GBXML. Um, there's a lot of weirdness in how Revit goes from rooms to GBXML. So we've been working with um, Mustafa over uh, Ladybug and Holly Honeybee with Pollinator. Um, sharing models with them and trying to build because that's an area that like, you know, I personally think the world is in a bit of trouble environmentally. Um, and we as designers spend a lot of time and fee trying to analyze. And if we can bring that down together, we can make an actual impact in the world, not just on our project's profit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, for a carbon gas that's, that's kind of tough. <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem. All right. Well, that was great. So any final words? You just uh, show this. Anything else you wanted to show before we conclude the session? That's it for me. I think uh, looking at the questions, I think we've got most of them. Well, that was super interesting. I've, awesome. I've learned a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, Bill. And yeah. so to remind people, some of the script, a few of them, I'll create a post and I'll describe what the script does. 
And then again, we can find you at uh, LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning. And if people type in. Yeah. yeah. And if people type in your name, they will find your course. Yep. All right. So if you want detailed steps for uh, what we saw today and how to recreate the Dynamo scripts, you can go to LinkedIn Learning. I will add uh, some of the script and describe what they do in the coming days. Awesome. And so quickly like that. Uh, next left. week, ep episode 27 with Melissa Thiessens. Uh The title of the show will be Lessons from Becoming a Consultant. That should be a lot of fun. 3 p.m. Wednesday next week. So thanks a lot, Bill. That was great. Thanks and for having me. Yep. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye-bye.